Um, so welcome very much. We're really, really thrilled to have a great lineup today. Um, Professor Bloomberg has gone through her Rolodex and collected um, a, a, some some really, really, really great people to talk to us. So it, I, the, the topic, as you can see on the screen, is don't pat the otters or walk barefoot um, and uh, barefoot in the bush. And um, I think these will become self-explanatory as the talk goes on. Um, I'm not going to do much more talking other than just to remind you of the kind of house rules. Remember, unless you're a, a speaker, you won't be able to unmute yourself, but you're welcome to type in the chat at any point if you have any questions. We encourage it because there's time for questions at the end. Um, there are CPD points available as well. I'll put up a link to that in the chat about half past the hour. So if you enter your details, if you click on the link about half past the hour, I'll put up that link and you'll be able to get uh, CPD points. Remember, we batch them about once every month or so. So um, it does take a little while to get through to HPCSA, but once that's there, you should be redeemed. Um, and I'm going to just pause there so we can get going with our, our very first speaker. Um, I believe that's Helen van der Plas. She is an infectious disease specialist. She's in the Cape Town area. She works in the in, in private sector as well as affiliated with some of the universities down there. Um, and we're very, very grateful for her taking some time off uh, to talk to us today. Uh, thanks, Helen. I'll just advance the slides when you say so. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks. And um, Lucille, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm definitely not a world expert in snake bites, but I'll, I'll try my best. And um, um, Jeremy, just uh, start with the first slide, please. Um, thanks. So the story began um, about three weeks ago with a policeman that stepped outside at night into his um, garden and he hadn't been very uh, good with looking after the vegetation, et cetera, on his small holdings. So stepped outside barefoot and felt a prick. I noticed it was painful, went back inside and then became very ill. Now he is based in Friedendam, I'll put a, left up, uh, on, a map up on the left, shows uh, the distance, um, to Cape Town where we have uh, potential treatment options available to him. So he steps out the next, oh, Jeremy, just advance, please. Uh, thank you. So the next day um, or early hours in the morning, um, about five, six hours, he presented to the emergency room with pain in his right foot and progressive uh, paralysis and he had difficulty moving his eyes. He had double vision ptosis and had uh, re respiratory compromise requiring intubation and subsequent ventilation. And we were called um, with the alert that uh, we may be dealing with a possible snake bite. So uh, just advance to the next slide, please. Um, the young doctor in the emergency room, however, noted uh, that, um, sorry, I just need to get my phone on silent here. <clears throat> um, he first noted only one puncture mark and he was concerned that this may be a scorpion sting and hence I put up the slide just to compare because sometimes when you stepped onto something at night and it could be thorn, it could be a rat bite, it could be any animal bite and in our region um, definitely a snake bite or scorpion sting is in the differential but just for the audience the a scorpion sting is um, associated with significant pain, which is also a feature in snake bite, and then paresthesia, and they may be occurring in the same limb or area where you were stung, or in uh, a different uh, area or distribution, it can be in a different dermatome as well. And then um, cranial nerve dysfunction may be a feature, and with or without somatic skeletal uh, motor dysfunction, that's mostly fasciculation, and these symptoms are often milder than in the snake bite with a neurotoxic venom. And there is significant uh, autonomic dysfunction in severe forms of envenomation. So urinary retention, salivation, et cetera. So 
And the severe toxicity with the parabuthis, that's the one with a thick tail and the thin pincers that we see in our uh, uh, sub-Saharan region in the arid areas, um, they usually cause severe disease in children and not so much in, el in, 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 in adults unless in the very elderly. And in snake bite, the neurotoxic venom is a uh, toxin that binds to the uh, postsynaptic region um, of the acetylcholine receptor. So it's a blockade at the neuromuscular junction and results in progressive descending paralysis with often the pineal nerve with bulbar dysfunction and blurry vision, double vision, and then the neck can also become weak and paralyzed. They have problems opening their mouth. They may also salivate, have difficulty swallowing the saliva, and that progresses then into respiratory compromise. Um, so that's just to help differentiate the two because that was a real question for the uh, young doctor in the emergency room. Um, and I just thought I'd compare those two in, in very briefly. Uh, Jeremy, in the next slide, please. Um, and with the history, history provided the uh, progressive uh, descending paralysis in our region, we only have really one um, neurotoxic venom produced by a snake here. That's our cave cobra. Um, I'm just showing on the right where, where this uh, um, um, snake is uh, a habitat that's quite uh, rain. It ranges into quite a couple of uh, uh, southern countries in well, Namibia and Botswana, and then um, the Cape uh, in the northern province as well. Um, we also have adders, but they cause more uh, cytotoxic uh, injuries, and the Cape Cobra is a pure neurotoxic uh, venom producing organ. Well, uh, animal. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So the indication, the, the young doctor called us, and we are a more tertiary facility with the ability to provide uh, antivenom, although when we received the patient, we didn't have any antivenom, um, but we were more likely in our region to acquire some. And he had clear signs of neurotoxicity and uh, was intubated and airlifted and came to us. Just as a reminder to the audience, the other um, um, indication for antivenom is progressive cytotoxicity. And there's a picture on the right that shows you the extent of local um, destruction that uh, cytotoxic uh, venom can cause. And, and of course, the Wurm's lung is a totally another in its own leak and can cause a coagulopathy as well. So um, there are very good guidelines that Lucille actually helped uh, reminding us and, and send it around in, on our ITSA uh, group uh, where the um, uh, guidelines very briefly are highlighted, highlighted on where and who should receive antivenom. Uh, Jeremy, next, next slide, please. And the antivenom was very difficult to acquire. And we got uh, two vials from a different uh, hospital in the north, um, then Somerset West Hospital. The mediclinic was kind enough to lend us some. And then we basically scrounged together from a couple of emergency rooms 10 vials of antivenom, uh, which we worked out would be appropriate for his weight and uh, um, um, yeah, uh, just basically weight based. And it's a polyvalent or, um, or poly specific um, antivenom. And it's, an, and it's an antibody that is produced against several snake species, and I think 10 in total. And um, it um, is sometimes very difficult to, uh, to, to obtain. And hence, it's so vital to be connected with emergency room um, the doctors. And that's where Lucille came in very handy with her networks. We were able to quickly um, activate a network and, and get uh, antivenom. And that um, gets given 
in um, 200 mole saline and very quickly over 30 minutes. One can give it longer, obviously over an hour if you're concerned, but the trouble is then you have to stand as a doctor for an hour next to the bedside and observe for an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, we gave the antivenom in ICU. We pre-dosed uh, the patient with uh, adrenaline and an ampule, called an ampule intramuscularly. The patient tolerated the antivenom uh, easily. There were no complications. And uh, just uh, next slide, please, um, Jeremy. And um, after 24 hours, he had a febrile reaction. And the bite mark was clear. There was no skin or skin structure infection. There were no other infections. And we think it was just a reaction to the antivenom. We, we actually uh, gave him a, a short dose or a short course of prednisone and he settled down and he made a full recovery. Uh, that's uh, four and a half days of ventilation and he's walking. Uh, I have permission of this slide. And, and the, the patient is actually a, um, a police commander in Friedendorf. So he's quite a prominent uh, figure in his community. And he returned with them home after six day hospitalization back home and he did not receive any antibiotics. Um, next slide, please. Now, I was made aware only last night that I had to comment briefly on antibiotics for snake bites. So is so, there a role? So, so Helen, I think um, this is gonna cover some of this. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think decide who's going to do this. Dress? Yeah. Just um, in terms of I'm saving. Okay. I, I'm going to, to, to do it, but I believe in uh, space repetition, so I've got no problem okay. if, All right. if, we, okay. if we just quickly go through it. Yeah, just got limited time. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I'll be one sentence. Basically, um, short, uh, my understanding and reading from the literature, there is no role for pro prophylactic antibiotics for snake bites. Um, uh, in early 90s, there was a large series from Blaylock published, um, and only 10% of those patients received uh, antibiotics, and those are the ones that had a cytotonic envenomation and complicated subsequently with uh, um, bacterial infection, which is obviously a risk uh, to develop. And then um, the organisms are interesting in that they are interbacteration, very um, so Eromonas, Morganella comes up and also in non-venomous snakes. So people that keep them as pets, they can also cause trouble sometimes in biting the finger and so on. And I think if you have a complicated snake bite, uh, it's probably better to take, once it complicates, Kate's to take tissue cultures uh, prior to starting antibiotic uh, therapy, and one would uh, cover the antibacteria and, and, and staphylococci. Those are organisms that you would like to cover in your antimicrobial uh, treatment. That's it. Thanks. Oh, and lastly, thanks, Lucille. Thanks for, for um, inviting me. And I just thought I'd put that in. Um, Lucille and her team are involved in emergency medicine. Uh, doctors are involved with uh, National Snake Bite Database, and they need to know where uh, the antivenom is required and uh, the high risk population so that there's adequate distribution. So, um, Lucille, I I'll leave it to you to, to give it a further uh, promotion. I'm, I'm going to hand over to Tris, who's the leading member of the National South African Snake Bite Advisory Group, and they're a wonderful resource. So thanks very much, Helen. Good outcome. <laughs> uh, hi, guys. I don't know if you can see me. Yes, we can. can. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thanks to Seal for inviting me to speak to your audience. Um, and, uh, you know, I love being invited for things like this because it always broadens my own knowledge. Uh, you know, the, the issue of uh, antibody prophylaxis post-snow bite is something that I've not really delved into that much. 
uh, until you've asked me to actually come and talk here. Generally speaking, I've not been advising anybody, and, and I know my colleagues from the National State Party Advisory Group have not really advising any of our colleagues to, to start prophylactic antibiotics post snake bite. Uh, and sort of that's been the, the approach that we've been taking. And um, it was actually good for me, Joe, now just to go and review the evidence a little bit or what evidence I could find in a short period of time. I really didn't have a lot of time to research this topic, so please excuse that. Uh, and I'll just uh, say one or two things here. And just say congratulations to Helen uh, for the management of that snake bite case, uh, that, that uh, um, Cape Cobra and Naja Nivea case. I think it was beautifully done and a very excellent outcome. Um, our Naja Nivea, our Cape Cobras, they are really dangerous uh, neurotoxic snakes. Uh, I think they rate as, as high as the black mamba. The venomology of the two snakes differ a little bit in the sense that the Cape Cobra has got a, um, almost a more potent and sticky postsynaptic alpha neurotoxin that goes and sit on, on the neuromuscular junction and, and causes paralysis. And we find these patients often need a, 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 a period of ventilation. Uh, the black mama bites, when we get them early, they tend to do quite well uh, if you give them antivenom early. But, but I must say we've had a Cape Cobra bite, the first one I've managed, uh, recently, and it's uh, not been that we have Cape Cobras here in Pretoria, but it's just that uh, we have a snake farm here where uh, people milk the snakes to, you know, supply SAVP with the venoms from which they produce the antivenoms. And the person who uh, cleaned the, or, or handled the uh, Cape Cobra got bitten and we managed him here. He came very quickly and uh, we gave him antivenom and he actually, uh, he actually, uh, we, we, we got him through the bite uh, without uh, the need for, for mechanical ventilation. But I think one must just be careful. I think Cape Cobra bites, my understanding from, 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 from many other experts is that in most cases, those patients need a period of, uh, of mechanical ventilation. Of course, administration of antivenom uh, remains a very important part of the treatment of those bites because they uh, shorten the stay uh, of the patient on a ventilator. As this case only needed four and a half days, probably would have been on the ventilator for 10, 12, 15 days if, uh, if the antivenom wasn't given and also given an adequate dose. One comment on, uh, on, on Helen's uh, presentation is that we generally don't advise a weight-based uh, dosage for antivenom. Uh, the snake injects a fixed amount of venom, whether it's a child or an adult or a pregnant patient or a patient with comorbid diseases, we advise that uh, that that a adequate dose be given to any of those population groups, irrespective of their weight. In fact, a child's weight body to 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 venom ratio is unfavorable, and uh, the child needs as big a dose of venom anti venom uh, as an adult. So, for example, ten vials. If you think about a vial of anti venom, it's really just. Uh, that this, this, it covers 10 snakes. Uh, we have a mnemonic, uh, you know, one run calls, two adders, uh, puff adder and uh, gaboon adder, three uh, mambas, black, green, and uh, jameson, and four cobras. It, it has got one mill that covers each of those 10 snakes. So you literally need to give 10 vials to give 10 mils of the antivenom that you need to cover. So Generally speaking, 10 vials for a cobra bite would be appropriate. You can go a little bit lower for, 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 for the cytotoxic bites sometimes, especially because of ven antivenom is not very available. We, we start off with four vials and then we, 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 work, we work our way up, uh, add, adding to that. No, no, no less than four vials though. <laughs> so we can go to the next slide. <laughs> the general principles is that most local <laughs> Most of the local effects is due to the venom and not due to uh, the bacteria in the snake's mouth. <laughs> and therefore, most of us do not recommend routine antibiotics being given prophylactic, prophylactically for snake bites. As of other bites, there's high-risk patients and high-risk wounds. So a high-risk patient would be somebody that's immunocompromised, somebody that is uh, diabetic and poor peripheral circulation, asplenic patients, those patients probably 
I would think a little bit harder about giving prophylactic antibiotics and high risk wounds would be contaminated in uh, wounds or wounds that already show signs of infection, um, crushed wounds and so on. And uh, even in the context of snake bite, that is a reality, especially when you talk about python bites, uh, because pythons can cause quite severe crushing type of bites uh, and penetrating wounds. So in those cases, iris patients and iris wounds, I would think a little bit harder of antibiotic uh, administration. Uh, there is, of course, some bacteria in snakes' mouths, and a number of studies have been done, uh, both in South Africa, and uh, Helen mentioned Blaylock study that was done in 2001, and some studies before that, and studies that's been done internationally on the flora of snake mouths, and uh, Blaylock found that venomous snakes do have higher amount of pathogenic bacteria compared to non-venomous snakes, so there is a risk of uh, bacteria being introduced. Um, and this increases, especially when there is the use of unsterile instruments to cut into the wounds and suck, you know, attempts to suck out the venom or other uh, things that are done to tamper with the wounds, uh, you know, applying chemicals to it or electrocuting it, etc. So those uh, situations do increase a risk for sepsis. All wounds should be managed with good local technique. In other words, the wound should be cleaned, typically with uh, cleaning solutions, saline, etc. Uh, and uh, well, most of these bites are, are, are really not, there's not much that you can clean, but uh, what, whatever you can, if there is a bit of a, a bite, you can clean. What you typically see is we see two fang marks, and that's, that's the, the, the upper jaw. And then at the bottom, we see a little row of fang marks as well. That's a typical, typical venomous bite. If you see a non-venomous bite, you typically see four rows on the top and four rows at the bottom as well, because they don't have those two, you know, fangs that they inject the venom with. But usually it's not very really dramatic wounds. It's usually quite, quite small little uh, puncture wounds. So there's usually not much that you can actually clean. Now, later on, the, the, wounds, the wounds tend to, to develop blisters and bullae. Uh, and generally speaking, those are uh, aspirated, especially when they are quite uh, dense. Um, Snake uh, bitten limbs should be nursed in a comfortable position. And then there's degrees of elevation that you can apply. Generally speaking, we say for most wounds is elevation to the level of the heart. Um, we don't want to elevate it too high, but because then you can actually cause the venom to spread. Uh, we don't want to let it hang because then it causes quite severe swelling and we also cause concentration. And especially people that's been bitten on digits like fingertips, they tend to lose those fingertips if it hangs because the venom concentrate in that area. In fact, there's a technique where some people advise us that if you're bitten on a digit, you, you sort of immediately after the bite, sort of do movements, quick movements with the limb to try to get some of that venom to spread a little bit out of that concentrated area in the digit, for, digit to try to prevent the digit from being lost. Uh, another thing with elevation is if you get a zero compartment syndrome, uh, and this is an important terminology for snake bite, is zero compartment syndrome because real compartment syndromes are extremely rare and only uh, usually only occur when things like tourniquets are applied uh, or the, the wound is really severely neglected, but, but it's, it's extremely rare. The correct terminology is actually just zero compartment syndrome. And that, that can be managed without doing a fasciotomy. Fasciotomy is actually cause a lot of additional morbidity and, and it's almost never indicated. So uh, uh, when you get a patient who develops a serial compartment syndrome, and I'll show a picture later on, you can do much more aggressive elevation uh, just to get that, uh, that, 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 that limp uh, to the swelling down a little bit. Uh, we, uh, for the surgical people, we, we recommend that they don't get aggressive with debridement within, uh, before 48, actually 72 hours, within three days, so that they allow full time for uh, necrosis to demarcate, because if you do surgery earlier, you have no idea where you do, what you're doing, and you're, you're, you're doing unnecessary cutting. So it's quite important to try to be, to encourage our surgical colleagues to just be a little bit patient with surgical management and do their debridements after about three days, uh, because then it's very clear which tissues are, 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 are necrotic and which tissues can be saved. Um, if there is uh, a pus coming out of these wounds and or serosanguinous discharge, it should be cultured because that will direct us into the right direction of which uh, actual organisms are in this wound and which antibiotics we can prescribe. And I'll talk a little bit about the organisms a little bit just now. 
Um, and then patients can be treated with appropriate antimicrobials. Then tetanus is another issue. And I'll talk when I talk about the flora of these snakes, uh, most of the studies have found anaerobic uh, uh, bacteria in the snake mouths. It's not the biggest group, but they are there. So, um, and I'll talk about a small case study of Nigerian cases where patients develop tetanus post snake bite. So it is a possibility. And as a general rule, I tend to advise tetanus prophylaxis for anybody that's been bitten by a snake. Now, this snake that uh, Helen spoke about, the Cape Cobra, don't normally cause any swelling and tissue necrosis. But now more and more, we're seeing that even this rule doesn't always apply. So we've seen some Cape Cobra bites now where there is swelling and necrosis. So these venoms are often, you know, a mixture of cytotoxic elements, neurotoxic elements, and hemotoxic elements. And we're seeing that even in, in bites that we traditionally thought never cause cytotoxic effects, you know, now we're starting to see bites that are actually causing that. So it's always a bit of a mixture of different venoms. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, uh, the risk factors to develop sexes in a snake bite is when there's the crosis at the bite site and there's, or there's a hematoma on the snake uh, at the bite site. And this is what uh, Blaylock found in his study. And so I just want to point out uh, 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 this uh, little child here was bitten by a Western Bart spitting cobra. And uh, we often, uh, you might have heard of this concept of skip lesions where there's postulated that this venom of the spitting cobras have got this mechanism whereby it can actually spread through the lymphatics and then cause like areas of necrosis in other areas. Now, whenever these spitting cobras bite, uh, if you look at the right side, you'll see there's this discoloration and there's going to be subcutaneous necrosis there. So these spitting cobra bites are high risk for developing infection. And uh, when they do develop infection, it's going to be appropriate to prescribe antibiotics to them. But again, we don't give it prophylactically. The, the skip lesions, uh, it's been questioned heavily now by, by and, I, and I wish I can do an animal study on it, but it's just so difficult to get ethical clearance because it would actually be nice to see if we expose a rat to this venom, if it really does do the skip lesions. We're thinking these spitting cobras, they bite multiple times. So rather than skipping, it's actually not uh, skip lesions, but it is multiple bites uh, uh, on the same patient. These snakes go into, they typically bite uh, people in their bed at night. The snake goes into the bedroom. The person moves. The snake bites uh, because there's a sort of a prey reflex. The person falls asleep again a little bit later. The person moves again. The hand moves. The snake bites there again. And now we get the spots of necrosis. Uh, so there's not really skip lesions. So if you see these spitting cobra bites, uh, the, the, the bite on the right-hand side, you can actually see the fang marks there. You can see that dark purple necrosis. There's deep necrosis taking place. There. That was a Mozambican spitting cobra. These ones cause a lot of localized ne necrosis. And I'll show you, it's a different clinical picture from the, from the uh, puff adder bite, uh, which causes quite a different uh, uh, appearance. Okay, so you can go to the next slide, just to show you the Mozambican, uh, oh no, I didn't, uh, it's maybe. Okay, so this, uh, this study from Blaylock, uh, it found, he went and he, and there's a lot of these studies, by the way, there's a couple of, this, this one is in South Africa, but they, and there might be newer ones, but this is the one I could quickly find. And, uh, but there's a lot of these studies, uh, there's, there's two others that are referred to uh, in Asia where they're swabbing the mouths of these snakes. And it's generally speaking, they're coming, and, and Blaylock refers to studies that's been done in South America. They all find more or less the same thing, which is actually quite nice. So the, what they find is that uh, there's a, most of the, the, the organisms is enterobacteria, so gram-negative uh, uh, enterobacteria. Ceremonas is one of the most common ones. Protease is one of the most common ones, even salmonella. And then uh, about 16% of the, uh, the mouse have got... Uh, Gram positive cocci in Blaylock study, he found Staphylococcus epidermidis. Uh, in one of the Asian studies, they actually find Nigeria, the uh, Atra, and they found Enterococcus fecalis. So, mostly, and then uh, uh, Blaylock only found 2.2% of anaerobes, but he criticizes his own study by saying his medium with which he actually grew these anaerobes were probably not very good. And we found, and, and other studies, uh, I found more anaerobes, uh, particularly Clostridia and Bacteroides. Uh, uh, and one study found them to be quite sensitive to metronidazole. 
Clostridium tetani was not very common or was not co commonly found in, found in any of the studies, but we do still advise uh, tetanus prophylaxis for all patients that was bitten by a snake because the snakes, you know, they're in the ground and they, their mouths, you know, they do have anaerobes in their mouths. So there is definitely a possibility that they can have Clostridia in their mouths. So we, we advise tetanus prophylaxis. It's been found in some studies. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Okay, this is just uh, the, those spitting cobras that I was sp speaking about earlier. The Mozambican spitting cobra is the one on the left side. This cobra is very common here in Pretoria, Johannesburg, uh, Lofeld, Highfeld, widely distributed. KZN up north, it goes all the way north until about Kenya. And then from Kenya up upwards, it's replaced by the red uh, spitting cobra or the Naja pallidum. This one is called Naja Mozambica, the Mozambican spitting cobra. Uh, this one is a very aggressive snake, comes into rooms at night, give multiple bites. Uh, as I said, we used to think it's skip lesions. Now we think it's multiple bites. It gets a lot of necrosis. Most of those people lose skin. Uh, it usually becomes secondarily infected. And at, those, at that point, a, pass, a swap, you know, initial maybe empiric antibiotic and then swaps uh, to, to, to direct antibiotic therapy would be appropriate. And then there's this Western Bart Spitting Cobra. This snake is uh, one that occurs in uh, Namibia. Both, uh, it, it, it's a big problem because uh, it, it, it often people get bitten by the snake and uh, people do aggressive surgery for it. They cut the wounds out. There's a surgeon there that sort of specializes in the snake. He goes in very early and he cuts out very aggressively. That's not what we generally advise for our Mozambican spitting cobras. Uh, we advise three days of, of, of restraint uh, and after three days, then only to do uh, the bridements on these snake bites. Unfortunately, the Mozambican spitting cobra bites and, uh, are not very uh, responsive to the antivenom. We, we give the antivenom and we do see that it makes a difference, but it's not as fantastic as it works, for example, for, for the puff feather bites. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a puff adder. It's a short, thick snake, uh, adder species. It is very cytotoxic. You know, the cytotoxic snakes are the adders in other words the puff adder the, the the gaboon adder and then also adders that are not covered by the polyvalent antivenom such as the night adder the many old adders and so on uh so the puff adder is a uh, adder that causes a lot of bites the other the other side of toxic snakes are the the spitting cobras two that i already showed you um like i say uh antivenom works fantastic for the puff adder bite uh, not absolutely as fantastic for the for the for the spitting cobra bites and you'll see the clinical picture here that i've got on the right hand side of somebody that's been bitten by the by the puff adder it's quite different it's much more subcutaneous swelling you don't get that purple skin discoloration followed by necrosis now this patient here actually that uh, picture on top uh, was after four vials of polyvalent antivenom and here at what 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 uh, we refer to as a zero compartment syndrome couldn't move his fingers, the limb was stiff and painful, and the surgeons were wanting to prepare him for, for, for theater to do a fasciotomy, and then we said, no, 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 this is serocompartment syndrome. The people that first diagnosed or got the idea of serocompartment syndrome was the Americans because they've got these uh, rattlesnakes, and a lot of their people have been bitten by rattlesnakes, and they've, they've first really started becoming aware of this concept of the serocompartment syndrome and, and, and really realized that, that fasciotomies is a useless procedure. Uh, I didn't put the sonar pictures here, but it's subcutaneous swelling. is not in the muscle compartment. And uh, we then diagnosed serocompartment syndrome. We aggressively elevated this limb and gave him six more vials, I think, uh, and then another two more vials. So we actually ended up with a dose of something like 12 vials and completely responded to it and he never needed to have that massively uh, damaging and more you know uh, morbidity creating incision of a, of, a, of a fasciotomy that's the picture of the bottom they received after antivenom uh, uh, um, administration we can go to the next slide uh, there was uh, this uh, case series that i just discovered uh, on the internet because i was looking for 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 tetanus uh, in the mouth of snakes and then this one came up or four snake bite victims who four snake bite victims who develop tetanus uh, after they've beaten in, in northern northern Nigeria. Now, uh, just to give a perspective, uh, there's about twenty thousand deaths from snake bite every year in Africa, 
uh, worldwide is about 160,000 deaths from snake bite every year. There's about a million, two million envenomations every year. Most of the snake bites in Africa, uh, most of the deaths in Africa, that 20,000 comes from a small little viper called the um, saw-scaled viper. And uh, this is a, a viper that occurs there in Nigeria and the surrounding areas there. We don't have it in South Africa, although SAVP do produce a saw-scaled viper anti-venom. Now uh, these 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 bites there in the north in northern in, in, in northwestern Africa is often people working in uh, rural areas, uh, and uh, they walk in the uh, it's legit bites in the sense that it's not people trying to handle snakes, it's people walking in the felt getting bitten by snakes, and these four cases uh, a couple of them were bitten by these um, I think two of the four were bitten by the saw scaled vipers, one was bitten by a cobra, another one by another snake. But these people didn't get to hospital very quickly. Uh, these saw scale vipers are also very cytotoxic. So these people had these necrotic wounds or these necrotic tissues. Uh, they sat on it. They only are presented to hospital 10 to 25 days afterwards. And two of them developed tetanus. Uh, well, all four of them obviously developed tetanus, but two of them died of tetanus. So also typical of tetanus, you get that. We had uh, two cases of tetanus recently and one of them died. So it's always this 50% mortality that you get from tetanus. But these, these, in this case, there was also, all of them got uh, the, the, the immunoglobulin. All these patients got the immunoglobulin, but two of them died. Uh, and the other two survived. So I think uh, the, the, the point that I'm trying to bring across is that the, uh, this anaerobic organisms is an issue in the, um, the, 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 the bites. Uh, they've been shown with these studies that looked at the, the, you know, the, the flora. There's been case studies written up of patients developing tetanus after bites. So it's not a very common thing. It's very uncommon. But I think, uh, you know, if a person has been a little bit not updated with his tetanus prophylaxis, then I would still, I still, I still advise it. So then the next one is another case. This one was from Asia. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, actually, no, I was just going to mention that other case. It was, it was another case that was bitten by a pit viper. Now, all these pit vipers uh, and, and rattlesnakes, all of them force these cytotoxic syndromes, pretty similar to what we get with, uh, with, with the puff adder here in South Africa. And in this case, also the person developed uh, tetanus afterwards. He was treated with the immunoglobulin and he also survived. So just to show that it is actually a, a, a quite an important thing. Now, uh, uh, this are another study of cultures of 20 of the tight pit vipers. It was just uh, coming from that very same uh, case study. And they found that uh, Clostridium perfringens and Bacteri Bacteroides fragilis were uh, anaerobic organisms that were found in 11. Uh, this is just the anaerobics that they found. So uh, all these ana uh, anaerobics were found, but they didn't actually find Clostridium tetany there. So uh, I, it doesn't seem that Clostridium tetany is a very common anaerobe or, or found in these snake uh, uh, flora, but it is there. And uh, so they actually found that uh, metronidazole covers most of these ones that they did find uh, quite well. And in the last slide, I think, is the next one. Uh, I thought this is also nice because it also touches on what Helen uh, mentioned earlier about the antibiotic uh, prophylaxis. This is just from a, st uh, this is from a Taiwanese study, again, about uh, you know, the oral bacteria in snake mouths. They found gram positive bacteria, also again, Pseudomonas and Proteus. They found first and second generation Kephalosporins weren't very effective, but they found that third generation Kephalosporins, Fluoroquinolones, Carbapenems, and Piptas were, were very effective against those ones. Then the gram negative bacteria, they found uh, Enterococcus uh, fecalis and Nazaria atra, and they found those to be sensitive to the penicillins and to vancomycin, and then the anaerobes they found to be very sensitive to metronidazole. So, yeah, that is uh, more or less my um, inputs about this topic. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm not sure. We're probably going to, I think there's some uh, another speaker too, so we'll probably just uh, go to that talk and then maybe do questions at the end. Sure. Thanks very much. It's absolutely brilliant. And, and as you can tell from, as the audience can tell, you clearly are a real pro at this and have done it a few times before. Um, so that's really, really great, uh, great advice. I'm just going to move on really quickly. But if you do have questions for the audience, please do type it in the chat. Um, I think we wanted just to hear from uh, Professor John Freen, if you're okay, John, to talk about this particular species of Salmonella, Salmonella Arizona. 
Uh, yes. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Jeremy. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yep. Yes. Um, yes. So, uh, Salmonella arizoni is is um, sort of famous uh, in terms of outbreaks associated with with uh, pets, uh, particularly pet turtles, but also other animals, um, uh, particularly in the United States. But it's really only one of, of many salmonella species and serovars which colonize uh, these animals. And um, there's nothing really uh, special about the organism itself. It's like basically like any uh, other salmonella. Um, and uh, these uh, reports of outbreaks are particularly associated with um, pet turtles in the United States. And although trading small turtles less than, I think it's less than four inches, is actually illegal, it's still widely done. There's a wide informal uh, uh, market for them as, as pets. So the turtles, but also um, really many reptiles harbor salmonelli in their guts, um, along with many other animals, of course. There was a, a study in somewhere in Europe, I can't remember exactly where, where they looked at um, the salmonella carriage in, in reptiles, um, kept as pets, snakes, had 92% of the snakes had salmonella in their, in their guts. Uh, lizards, 84%, um, turtles, 60%. And um, of importance is the swabs of tables and floors at reptile exhibitions where they did this study. Um, more than 80%, they could isolate salmonella from more than 80% of those surfaces. So uh, basically it's handling of, of reptiles of any sort that will contaminate hands and then go on to cause gastrointestinal infections. And there's, if I have just one minute, there's a famous report of a reptile exhibition which included Komodo dragons. And I think it was in the United States where there was a substantial number of visitors developed diarrhea and something like 65 people were infected or suspected to be infected uh, with, with a salmonella species. And they did a case control study and found that, in fact, almost none of them, very few, one or two only, had actually touched the the, ex, the exhibit, the Komodo dragon, uh, Komodo dragons themselves, but they had all handled the railings of the enclosure, and it was that that was the source of the infection. The dragons were depositing salmonella after hours by licking the railings and um, contaminating in that way. So the bottom line is, yeah, under any circumstances. If you have to handle a, a reptile, just make sure you wash your hands afterwards. I think that's all I've got to say. Great. Thanks, John. That's good advice in, in many, many, um, many spheres <laughs> for reptiles, both um, both reptilian and human. OK, I'm going to just uh, load up uh, the next one. So thanks. Thanks very much. So you've given us a sneak preview of the second half. We've learned about not walking barefoot in the bush. This is about don't pat the otters. So we've got uh, uh, Brett Glasby here, who's uh, the Marine Wildlife Management Program Coordinator at the Two Oceans Aquarium Foundation. It's a great privilege to have you here, Brett. Um, you're welcome. You can take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you um, for having me, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to just, I'll, I'll make it fairly quick, just being cognizant of the time. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about Cape Clawless Otters and Cape Fur Seals. Uh, so obviously both these species have been fairly common along the Cape coastline for forever uh, and relatively no impact with people. Very few incidences of um, any interactions that led to bites or anything like that. 
until this past 14 or 15 months. Uh, so with Cape Clawless Otters in particular, post-2020 um, lockdown, we saw that the otters had become a lot more brazen around human habitation and moving into urban areas and even city areas. So at the moment, we know we've got populations around Seapoint, Greenpoint, the v waterfront, and then various other little suburbs and towns along the coastline. Um, what's happened though, is that we've noticed over the last few months that these otters have become a lot more brazen. They'll also seem to be a little bit less tolerant of people sharing the space. So I can speak particularly around the v waterfront. Uh, what we had is a little family of otters that took over one of the hotel swimming pools during lockdown. Post lockdown, obviously the tourist um, side of things took time to get going. And this uh, December, 2021, we started seeing our tourist numbers going up quite substantially. And these otters began nipping people in the swimming pool. So biting people that were in the swimming pool, they would sneak into the pool, from the uh, surrounding canals, they get into the pool, approach people and then bite them on the feet. So I think so far we've had 19 people that have been impacted and only one was to the hand. The rest were all to the feet. And most of them were swimmers or in the canals or stand-up paddle boarders in the canals or people in the actual swimming pool. Um, we can move to the next slide. So this is just a, a quick little snapshot of what happens in the canal. The image on the left is the otter essentially going for a swimmer's feet and the swimmer trying to get his feet out of the way as quickly as he can. Uh, that was rather unsuccessful. The photo on the right, he finally got his feet out onto the ledge. Uh, he did sustain a small nip to the foot, uh, but that was the only way he could get the otter to stop um, sort of going for him. Uh, next slide. All right, so we had to be very aware that the language that was being used as well was quite uh, important. Everyone was talking about otter attacks and otter bites. It created a lot of negativity. People were getting very scared. And in a few more slides, you'll see why we, we needed to sort of manage that situation very closely. So when we spoke about bites and attacks, we actually changed the language. And if you move to the next slide, we turned bites to nips and attacks to interactions. And this was just to calm general public down. We obviously are working in an environment that is very tourist in involved, very high numbers of public, as well as tenants that are trying to earn money there. Um, so we can quickly opt to the next, next slide. So we had to monitor the narrative. Uh, this is the extent of the injuries. So you can see very small amounts of blood, a small puncture wound on most of them. Uh, out of the 19 bites, we had one um, woman that required a single stitch to close up the small puncture wound. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's more like a scratch. Now, if we look at this compared to the capabilities of an otter, I know of a case several years ago in Pretoria where a woman lost her calf muscle to an otter. So that was a full-blown attack. The otter was very angry and it managed to... Uh, tear her leg apart and remove the calf muscle. So they can do a lot of damage, um, but what we are seeing is far more of these small little nips to the toes. That, the top right hand one there is I think on the wrist. So that was the hand wrist one, but the rest are just these very, very small little minor wounds to the toes. Uh, I think there is somebody that's gonna be speaking off to me more around the, the sort of disease risks and, and infection risks and that around this. Um, there's been a lot of questions around rabies with regards to otters. Um, and it is something that we've obviously been researching quite extensively, but uh, it's not my area of thought at mine's more dealing with the animals themselves. So we can move to the next slide. All right, Cape fur seals, much larger animal, uh, definitely capable of causing a lot more damage. We generally say that the bites from Cape fur seals are very similar to a dog, and they are called sea dogs or dogs of the sea. And the bite is very, very similar. The elevated risk with regards to seal bites is if it happens in water, obviously there's a, a drowning risk that is potentially going to happen there. Um, so if we move to the next slide. All right, so this was an attack, I think it was about two weeks ago from a seal, uh, but a surfer and a bodyboarder in Bloberg. And that bite on the right hand side was essentially through a wetsuit and still created a fair amount of damage. 
Uh, what's happening with our seals is that at the end of 2020, we saw a mass, or sorry, 2021, we saw mass seal die off. Uh, when studies were done on, on the carcasses, it was found that they'd, we, we were experiencing the die off due to demoic acid poisoning, which obviously they get via the red tide. So feeding in a red tide, the demoic acid builds up in the system and it becomes toxic and kills them. But it doesn't kill all of them. Um, so the animals that do survive the initial attack or the initial demoic acid poisoning suffer long-term effects. Uh, so demoic acid creates swelling around the heart and the brain. And we found that if we look internationally in New Zealand, as well as in California, it's been researched and found that there'd be a demoic acid die-off. And then for the next 18 months, we'd see elevated levels of aggression with seals. We've now experienced the same thing here. We had a mass die-off, and for the past 14 months, we've had elevated numbers of aggressive seal behavior. Uh, so they've been close on 40 bites now over the last few months all along the coastline, um, most of them around the seal island in Hout Bay, obviously a high concentration of seals. And the behavior that we're seeing is that these animals behave normally until they go under stress, and then obviously that would normally spark off a fight flight uh, or fight flight or freeze response and the only response that these animals take is to fight uh, so when they go under stress they change the behavior almost instantly and instead of trying to get away from people they actually go straight into an attack a very notable case that made media throughout the world recently was an attack on clifton fourth beach a very small seal behaving rather oddly there are video clips there's in fact three video clips i have got the middle one here that everyone's welcome to see um, in a moment but uh essentially the seal's behaving rather oddly uh, there's a lot of people on the beach he's a bit under stress there's lots of opportunities for him to escape the situation and instead of doing that he enters the water and attacks a child uh members of the public pull him off the child and get the child away and from there, he goes straight into an attack on a, an adult, a, a woman that was in the water. A um, member of public grabs the seal and holds it until all the people have moved out of the water. And then he flings it as far as he can. Um, and the clip ends there. This, the third clip in the series is actually where the seal, after being flung into water, comes back onto the beach and carries on trying to bite people on the beach. So quite a, a severe attack and very abnormal behavior. And as I say, the bites are very similar to dogs, but uh, there are various risks there. Obviously, tetanus and um, seal finger is, is probably the most notable one, uh, which I believe is going to be spoken about after I have done my presentation. But if we can just, uh, Jeremy, if you're able to play that video clip. Uh, is it was it part of the presentation or is it is it a no no it's just, I sent it uh, separately as a clip separately uh, yeah uh, let, let me just get it quickly one second all right. So while we're waiting for the clip, I'll just say the first clip in the series is actually just the seal. He's grabbing pieces of kelp, flicking them around, throwing them, mock charging people on the beach that come to within sort of three meters of him. And all right, this is now the one that went viral. I'm sure many of you have actually seen this video clip online, but we'll just play it anyway. So yeah, he's entered the water and he goes straight up the child. Members of the public are getting involved. They managed to get the child away. Now, if you look at the number of people in the water, there's many opportunities for this seal to actually go past the people and get out to the open water. It doesn't have to be engaging. And normal behavior would be to not engage. Normal behavior would be where the animal moves away. The public were all called out of the water. Now, this particular woman did not hear the call from the lifeguards to get out the water. You can see the seal moving up to her from behind. And he goes straight into bites. She suffered bites to both her hands, quite severe bites to both her hands. Um, I did ask her for photographs for this presentation. She unfortunately was not comfortable to share the photos at this time. But um, there you go. Member of public has now got the seal. He's holding it up and away from his body. Um, getting 
hammered by the waves, but he's trying to hold it until everyone's out the water. And he gives it a really good flick into the water now. And immediately after this clip, that seal came back out and started trying to bite people on the beach. So this wasn't the end of the, the incident. Uh, but very abnormal behavior, not anything we'd normally see with seals around our coastline. Uh, I've been working with seals for, well, since 2009, so quite a few years now. And I've never encountered this behavior until this past year. And we've seen it over and over and over again. There's been several clips online that have gone viral. There was one in Fishwick Beach that was chased up the beach in Britain. Uh, she was the second person that was bitten by that same seal on that morning. Uh, there's been yeah these clips and then several of the guys that do sort of tourist uh, things with seals around Half Bay, a number of them have been bitten as well. But that was, yeah, in a nutshell, very quickly, just a presentation on what we are seeing around the increase in seal and otter bites on our coastline. Great. Thank you so much. And a huge appreciative of, of the time you've, you've made for us. Um, I, apparently the audio didn't play for, for the audience, but it's pretty dramatic. I will see if we can get it going. Um, but uh, you, you clearly have a, you, your days are clearly never boring. Um, <laughs> no, never. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for your time. I'm just going to hand over just briefly to, to Professor Bloomberg uh, just for the, for the final talk. Thanks very much. I have the first slide. I just got three, I think. So, wow, really quite scary stuff. Going to avoid the sea and look under my bed. Don't walk barefoot in the bush. So um, we get quite a few calls on our rabies hotline on the NRCD clinicians helpline. And we received a number of them from people bitten by otters or seals uh, asking about the risk of rabies. And we, when you look at that abnormal behavior, you think, gosh, this has to be a rabid seal. Um, but I think you've explained it very well. There's been one case of rabies in an Arctic seal. Um, a ring seal in Norway in 1981 related to an outbreak in Arctic foxes. But for the most part, it's not a risk. Tetanus um, actually need to be concerned about, but there are some specific infections um, that one needs to consider. Next one. So I think um, that's just a bias on otters. I'm sure put out by you. Next one. This is the last slide. So this is um, something called seal finger, and it's... Um, even if it's somewhere else, it's all still called seal finger, described in the early uh, 1910, but the causative organism was only identified actually not such a long time ago. Um, quite painful, violaceous, huge swelling, um, and uh, seen in whalers and sealers and uh, wildlife people, and I guess tourists in, in, in Cape Town. Next one. So we've been asked about what are the risks, what should you do, what sort of antibiotic treatment should we give? Um, and uh, so there really are four organisms that I think are important as well as the usual staphs and streps. I'm not an expert on this, but seal fingers caused by mycoplasma foco cerebrale. Um, that's the picture that you saw. And um, it's important to include something like doxycycline or maybe a um, ciprofloxacin and aquinolone in treatment to cover for this. They can be very severe. They can um, have long-term sequelae of arthritis. Um, so whether you wait for the infection or you give it prophylactically, it's not clear. But doxycycline for at least two to six weeks is really not good studies. The second would be Vibrio valnificans, which we seem not to have in the southern, uh, southern Cape. The water is too cold. Um, so that's not common, although I think up in Nasna there have, has been the case. Mycobacterium marinum is uh, part of the differential diagnosis, and then erysipelosrix rhizopathia causing is, um, erysipeloid needs to be considered. So um, there's quite a nice uh, case presentation in the Fitzer case of the month, which Jeremy will pose, and it's from uh, uh, Max Winkler, who has a practice in Heart Bay. He's treated about 10 patients over the last uh, few years who've been bitten by seals. And um, I think he gives a, a very nice explanation and discussion on, on seal finger. So I think I'm going to stop there, Jeremy. We've uh, reached the time. And then perhaps there are just one or two questions for our speakers. Sure, absolutely. 
um, that that's a pretty pretty dramatic stuff <laughs> for everyone concerned between um, between snake bites and 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 uh, seal and otter bites. So um, there's one question which I guess is for you, Brett, if, if you're still around, is about about this uh, demog acid. If once the seal's been affected by it, is it does it eventually get better or is the damage permanent? So we, we don't 100% know yet, because obviously to test all the wild populations, I say New Zealand and California are a bit ahead of us in studies. Um, to do demoic acid poisoning tests on all the, the populations is, is difficult. So we're only seeing the animals that are showing the aberrant behavior. And so far, the bulk of them shortly thereafter have um, died, most likely due to heart failure from the stress and the um, damage to the heart from the swelling that was caused by demoic acid. So most of the seals that we've dealt with that have shown this aggressive behavior have, have died shortly thereafter. Um, but in terms of how many animals are actually affected and how many um, sort of survive without any ill effects, we don't really know. What we do know is that New Zealand and California both um, only recorded these aberrant behaviors for roughly 18 months. Um, so it's possible that any affected animals actually just... Uh, take themselves out. I mean, any animal that's not gonna run away from a predator and rather take it face on, whether it's a great white shark or a boat propeller or a, a group of humans on a beach is unlikely to, to survive that experience very for very long. Yeah, that's uh, well put. And then there's one, one final question, I guess, either for you or for Professor Bloomberg about penguin bites in Cape Town. Apparently this NRCD hotlines had two calls recently. Um, about penguin, should we say penguin nips or whatever it is, <laughs> rather than attacks? Maybe, uh, maybe Brett, you you can um, come in there. I yes, yes. The same so, infectious risks apply. I don't know. Not my field. Uh, no, not quite. I mean, look, penguins. I can I can honestly tell you that uh, having worked with penguins for a long, long time, that they, uh, they almost all bite. Um, if you get too close, you are going to get a bite. I'm surprised there's only been two calls to the hotline. They're more likely to bite than an otter or a seal. Um, I think your biggest risk there is bacteria. Obviously, they fed raw fish and they feed off raw fish. So the bacteria in their beaks is, is quite severe. When I've been bitten, yeah, generally get a, a fairly nice little localized infection, which just gets treated up quite quickly with the antibiotic cream. If you start it straight away, it does clear up after a few days. But uh, yeah, they, they do carry a lot of bacteria in their mouths. I'm not sure of the composition of that, but a penguin bite is is actually a fairly common occurrence. If you get too close to one or you try and touch one or grab one, they are almost definitely gonna bite you. Yeah, I think augmentin plus doxycycline is probably a safe bet for most of these bites. Great. Well, thank you so much to everyone. I know we've got a little bit over time, but it was honestly, it was one of the more entertaining talks we've done in a long time. I had a, a great time uh, and, and lots, of, lots of comments either to me in, on WhatsApp or in the chat as well about thanking all the speakers. So thank you again um, to Helen Plus and Greece and 